how well do we understand how COVID is transmitted? There's, there's droplets of different sizes, uh, aerosols, tiny, tiny droplets. Mm -hmm. It seems like that's a very difficult thing to understand thoroughly. Uh, so it seems like it's transmitted like both ways. It's unclear how exactly. So how, how, how much do we understand and why is it so difficult to understand well, it fully? I think it's clear that it's transmitted through the air, mostly. It's not touching. We thought initially it would be a lot of touch, but very little of that. It's through the air. And when you talk, mainly when you talk, you, you expel a lot of droplets, right? Even the plosives that your foam thing mm -hmm. here is, are meant to pee, right? right? That you send out little yeah. sprays and those have viruses in them. And the big drops fall to the ground and the little ones can go 100 feet or more, right? Mm -hmm. But the little ones also have less virus in them. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure, well, we certainly do not know how much virus you need to be infected. Right. But it's probably at least several thousand particles, if not more. And it could be that for most people, the tiny droplets don't have enough virus to infect someone else. But there's one observation about this virus that's really interesting. And that is that 80% of transmissions are done by 20% of the people, of the infected people. Not every infected person transmits. That's been borne out in multiple studies. And in fact, there's a study at University of Colorado where they quantified the viral RNA loads in all the swabs that had been done of students for like a six-month period. And most of the infectious virus, most of the RNA copies were found in 15 to 20% of the people. The rest had really low, and they're probably that's probably why they don't transmit. So those are the ones that might get vi enough virus in the tiny droplets to be able to infect someone at a distance. And I think that's entirely possible. Why is it hard to study? You can't do it in real life because you don't know who's infected. And if you do, there's, there's not a controlled environment to measure droplets and so forth. You'd have to do it in a laboratory situation. If you use an animal, you just don't know what the relevance of that is to people. You'd have to use human and do challenge experiments. And, you know, we, we don't do that at this point, at least not for this virus. So that's why it's hard to know what's going on. So we have to make inferences from epidemiological associations where you're studying, say, transmission in a household where people are stuck in the same rooms together. And you can get an idea of what kind of droplets were involved in So that. that makes it much harder to, if you're if you're leaning on epidemiological stuff as opposed to like biophysics or something like that, the, the, the mechanics. Very yeah. hard. So Very hard. that makes it, but that makes it really hard to then develop solutions like masks, to ask the question, how well do masks work? Because then to answer that question, you can lean on epidemiological stuff again, like looking at populations that wear masks versus don't wear masks. As opposed to sure, like sure. actually saying, uh, like from an engineering perspective, like what kind of material and what kind of tightness by which amount decreases the viral load that's received on the other end. But you, you, some experiments have been done with masks and just droplets with no virus in them, right? Right. Yes. And you can measure the the efficiency of different mask materials at keeping those in. So right? if I say that this mask stops 70% of this or larger size droplet, mm -hmm. that leads to this percent decreased transmission. Um, and also on both the the generation and the, 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 the receiving end and the giving end. Sure. So, so how well do masks protect you from others? How well do you do masks protect uh, others from you? Like all of those things seem like they could be more rigorously studied. There's no doubt about it. And now is the time because once this is over, nobody's going to do it. Nobody's going to care. No. Right. But it seems like to me, so tests is one thing, but masks, like the good mask, whatever the good means, whatever that means, like some level of a quality of material on your face, if it's shown to actually like thoroughly shown to work well, mm -hmm. that seems like an obvious solution. 
uh, to re reopen society with, if you have a good understanding of how well they work. Because if you don't have a good understanding, if there's a lot of uncertainty, that's when you get, and you have people speaking from authority, that's when you start getting the po politicization of the solution. Of course, of course. No, the data, there are some data, Most they're mostly epidemiological, and they show some effect in some countries, right? But they could be way better. Yeah. And, but the, the fact that they are not perfect, then people take advantage of and say, well, look, they don't work that well, so I'm not going to wear it. I think, as you said, people can use it as an excuse. But even if it works, so Daniel always says it, a mask will cut down transmission by 50 to 60%, and then distance will do another 30%. Yeah, those numbers are made up, though. <laughs> I mean, they're not made up, but they're estimates. Absolutely. And many of them are made uh, uh, based on models, right? Yeah. We make this model, and let's say the mask cuts down this much. What's what will be the effect on? It? Right. I mean, yeah, they're models, and it's for the same reason. I I don't believe the transmission uh, var of the variants because it's all based on statistical models as well, not biological experiments done right. in the lab. So that in that sense, vaccine data is much better than mask data. <laughs> For sure, for sure. So, so my, my problem with the mask data, which I always thought was fascinating, I stopped talking about it. I was in a paper about masks. I stopped talking about it because what, what started happening is masks created assholes on both sides. The people that were like in Silicon Valley, the friends of mine that were wearing masks, <laughs> the way they look at others who don't, is like well, that's that's a whole nother issue, but right? That's, yeah, but that what that I understand that happens when you don't have solid science. Understood. They th now yeah. start judging you like you're a lesser human being. You're not only uh, dumb, but you're just you're almost like evil. You're doing bad for society by not wearing a mask. And then the people looking in the other way uh, are seeing you for the asshole that you're being for judging them. Uh, unrightly, so they almost want to say "f you" by not wearing the mask, and there's this division that's created. That that was heartbreaking to me because masks, like testing, is a solution that was available early on, mm -hmm. and if understood well, it could be deployed in a mass scale. And it seems like there's some historical evidence for other viruses where it does yes, very well. That's correct. And so and so like the fact that this was politicized, um, yeah, it was a little but bit heartbreaking. You can find in the literature studies, mostly of healthcare workers and influenza, where you can actually, because you see the people every day, they can sample them, you can actually see what masking does. And some of them show an effect and others do not. Then that's the problem. That's yeah. like any trial, sometimes if it's not big enough and then people latch on to that, see, it doesn't really work. But I think the main issue is that in January, both CDC and WHO said, Masks don't work, don't use them. That was the kiss of death for masks mm -hmm. because when they then changed their mind, they didn't say we screwed up. They yeah. just said wear masks. If they had said we made a mistake, we were wrong, I think more people would have worn masks, but they didn't. Yeah. And like you said, admitting you're wrong is like <laughs> a real big part and of it. I also it. think almost the better way is not just saying you're kind of saying you're wrong, but in January saying, like revealing the uncertainty under which we operate. Like actually, like uh, reveal what was done uh, in, with the Spanish flu at the, the, the beginning of the previous century. Because mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of mass controversy then too. It went back and forth. And that was actually the source of a lot of distrust there too. <laughs> so, and then uh, look at influenza, like how is it effective with that? And just reveal this, we're, we don't we don't know, but uh, with like with some probability, this is the best option we got right. currently. And then and then in a month or two, adjust it, saying that you know what our like the uncertainty decreased a little bit. We have a better idea. Like that was a, a that was an incorrect estimate. But reveal that you're struggling. It's not like this weird binary clock that goes one direction or the other. You're struggling in with uncertainty and like trusting. People maybe criticize me sometimes for this, but I, I I think most people are actually intelligent. <laughs> like trusting the public to be intelligent uh, with if you give them if you have transparent and give them uh, information in a real authentic way. Like don't look like you're hiding something. I think they're intelligent enough to use that data to make decisions. It's the same thing as with the testing. Is if if you put that power in the people's hands to know if they're sick or not, they're going to make uh, unmask the right decision.
I think. It, it, it's uh, that the masks and the testing has been uh, a bit heartbreaking. I think it's a good point, though, that most people don't seem to have an objection to testing. <laughs> it's a good point. Yes. Yeah. And then obviously Makamina makes that point brilliantly. Yeah. And still, there's very little excitement around that. But he said he was going to do it. I don't understand. I mean, I haven't spoken to him since then. So I don't know why. He's what... pushing it. Well, I mean, but he can't do it alone. He has to get. So one of the, one of the resistances is FDA doesn't like cheap things. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to approve it. So it makes the mass manufacturer. Uh, like uh, with the emergency exceptions, all those kinds of things, very difficult. And then there's not much money to be made on it without that. I don't know. That, I, I think there's just economic pressures against it. And because so much investment uh, was uh, placed on the vaccines, and obviously mm -hmm. there's an incentive mechanism there where the companies, sure, you know, lobbyists sure. and all those, <laughs> there's this machine that says, uh, um, Arguing for tests is difficult because the thing that's worked for most severe viruses in the past is vaccines. Now we have vaccines, why the hell would you need tests? At that time, like, why the hell do you need tests when we can be working on vaccines? It seems like the obvious thing to be working is the vaccines from, from their perspective, mm. but it's not obvious at all to me. I think you should have both. I think you have vaccines and good testing and that covers you really well because you're always going to have people who don't get vaccinated. 